Well, I'm in my second sermon on a series I started last weekend entitled Wisdom for Living. Wisdom for Living. I mean, wisdom isn't just a scriptural concept or a word that really has little relevance or meaning to your day-to-day life. Wisdom for living is really what the Bible is all about imparting to us. The Bible is not just a bunch of do's and don'ts to make life difficult for you. It is a revelation of the truths that will set you free, the truths that will in, enhance your quality of life uh, many, many fold that you'll not be able to duplicate any other way. And so wisdom is, first of all, what this book is all about. But in particular, there are concepts that are given us in the Word of God that we need to have some understanding of if they're going to benefit us. And the Word says that wisdom is the principal thing in a person's life. Wisdom is the principal thing, not faith, not grace, not love. We have a lot of things that seem to be really important to us at a given point in our life, but wisdom is the principal thing. And so the best way to begin the the series, as I did a week ago, is to begin with definitions. I think that... um, I shared Dake common, Dake's commentary uh, definition of wisdom, which I like a lot. Finnis Dake, uh, an amazing man. Uh, the Bible that he authored, along with the indices on either side uh, of the center reference column, really tell us a lot of wonderful things and supportive information that help us understand the Word. He is, uh, you know, from... Uh, uh, bit of a religious background, so there's some legalistic things that you'd have to ignore, but he's got much valuable statistics and information that are good for us to have, and I particularly like his definition of wisdom. He defines wisdom as the capacity for a believer to discern the best ends and the best means for achieving those ends. He's talking about your ability to understand what your priorities in life should be to experience the fullest life that you can experience and then the means to achieve those ends. A lot of times we have ideas that are correct, things that God says should be important to us. The most important being his plan for your individual life which is different than anybody else's. And you're not going to find it written out uh, paragraph by paragraph in the Word of God. It's ministered to us by the Holy Spirit, but that's the ultimate end in terms of importance to you. And there are many ends uh, prior to that that relate to intermediate goals and objectives you would set in moving your life toward that direction. Very seldom do we see the whole big picture in one fell swoop. We know where we're going, where the purpose of God has taken us in our life, and all of the intermediate goals and objectives about how to get there. It's usually something that is revealed as we move faithfully from one set of goals and objectives to another. And then there are some uh, things that he makes very clear to us that by virtue of our covenant with him, uh, he wants to be important for us to achieve. Ends that we should achieve. The promises of God are those ends, the promises that your covenant brings to you and says are the will of God for your life, and he has a way for you to achieve it, such as healing, such as all sufficiency in all things, such as good relationships based on the power of agreement as opposed to the division the enemy wants to generate. And so we see these promises of God as being ends unto themselves. It's the will of God that you be healed. It's the will of God that you have all sufficiency in all things. 
It's the will of God that you be joined together with other believers in common cause. One heart, one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So we can understand that the Bible is a revelation of what we would refer to as spiritual wisdom. But it is also going to be something you can ask the Lord for to have practical wisdom for living in this natural world that we live in. It's both types of wisdom that are needed. The Bible gives us, um, uses a couple of different types of wisdom in the New Testament uh, for, basic, for the basics of our learning process. But first of all, there's the practical wisdom, phronesis, P-H-R-O-N-E-S-I-S, the Greek word, and it means prudence or practical wisdom, worldly wisdom. It is the wisdom needed to navigate the challenges of this natural life we live in. The other principal type of wisdom he talks about in the Greek New Testament is Sophia, S-O-P-H-I-A, and it literally, if you look at the Strong's, defines it as worldly or natural and spiritual wisdom. This is both kinds of wisdom. Phronesis, you know, speaks to the practical side of wisdom. But Sophia, when that word is used, refers to both the natural wisdom and spiritual wisdom that will be needed in this life. And that's why he says in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Christ has been made wisdom unto us. It's available to us in Christ. Just like every other in Christ truth we see in the Word, it is yours by faith. You know, such as you are the righteous, righteousness of God in Christ. Now, it may not look like that lines up with the natural truth because you know how you acted the other day. You don't feel like you're very righteous, but the word means principally right standing with God. And because of the finished work of Christ, he sees you as righteous in Christ. And, and there are many other things that we could spend time on. Healing is one of them. You know, of course, we know that... Uh, by the stripes of Jesus you were healed, therefore you are healed. And that includes not only your physical body, but your soul, because the chastisement of our peace was upon him. These are redemptive realities. It's part of who you are in Christ. A lot of good things. You're more than a conqueror in him, through him who loved you. You can do all things in Christ who strengthens you. So essentially we see these truths or spiritual reality which will change contradictory natural circumstance if that's where we invest our faith. If you have more tendency to believe the doctor's report that you're going to die in another three months with cancer than you do by the stripes of Jesus you're healed, then you'll die. But if you get to a place where you genuine, your belief system is genuinely more established in the spiritual truth of who you are in Christ, it will change the natural truth you're dealing with. Faith is the bridge between those two arenas of truth. But wisdom lives in those two realms as well. There's spiritual wisdom that comes to us through the Word of God, and there's natural wisdom that comes to us through secular wisdom or the mind of man. And you need both kinds in order to live successfully in this natural world. It seems like sometimes we get the idea that, you know, we're, we're, we're just, the spiritual truth always provides in both arenas. No, it changes contradictory natural or temporal truth when you invest your faith in it. But what you need when you when you ask for wisdom as God tells you to, you're asking for wisdom spiritually and wisdom naturally that corresponds with the spiritual truth. And that is the corresponding action to your faith or the works that the Word talks about we need to do. 
You need to know what on, what, not only what the best ends are, to be healed, to be all sufficient in all things, to have good relationships, but you need to know the means to achieve those ends. And for spiritual truth, there's spiritual means. For natural truth, there's natural means. And you're being told to ask God for both, not just one or the other. And one of the reasons I'm convinced that a lot of people don't receive the end of their faith, if they're believing for healing, for instance, yes, there's spiritual wisdom that says that's been purchased for you by the finished work of Christ, and the means that you achieve that by is faith. But there's also a natural wisdom regarding good health. Some of it is scientifically established truth. Other is just what the logical capability of man will produce. Reason is given us by God, the ability to reason. He says, come let us reason together. And that's for the natural arena. So there are things naturally that will correspond to the spiritual mandate for healing that you receive by faith. But, you know, for your faith to be sustained, you're going to have to do the natural things as well. This weekend marks the 156th anniversary of Juneteenth, a holiday many have heard of but still don't understand why we should celebrate. Juneteenth is not a black holiday, it's the American holiday where all Americans became truly free. While the founding fathers stated all men were created equal with the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, black Americans wouldn't share this legal right for another 87 years until President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, when he declared all slaves shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. However, the Union would have to win the Civil War before they could enforce this new law on the Confederate States. It took two and a half years for the war to end. On June 19, 1865, Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas to tell the last slaves of their freedom. The newly freed Americans abbreviated June 19 into Juneteenth. On this day, we celebrate freedom for all and those who fought to make it happen. Even though freedom was granted, we know that equality did not immediately follow. Juneteenth is a day to celebrate how far we have come and recognize there is still progress we can make together. So basically, understanding is an important thing. And there are 10 things the Bible talks about in the New Testament that he calls mysteries. It's given unto us to know these mysteries. Some of these mysteries he actually says not to be ignorant of. And so we need to have understanding to realize God's fullness and blessing in our life. May not sound real exciting to a lot of people, but, you know, science knows it is a fact that you can destroy your health by eating wrong. And it is a truth. You can eat very poorly in terms of your food choices, meaning if you gravitate toward the sugars, toward the carbs, more than is meat or good, then it will have a, an extremely inhibitive effect on your health. Too much sugar intake increases insulin resistance. It's a scientific fact. It leads you toward diabetes and many, many other problems. And sugar can be more addictive than cocaine, they say. And that's not my idea. That's what you can read about. But so we know that there are certain things you shouldn't do. As much as I like pecan pie, and I'm going to battle with my flesh to partake of it, you know, uh, I need to be aware of the downside of letting it go too far. I, I'm not going to get in bondage. I'll have a piece of pecan pie here or there. Maybe a couple of pecan pies here or there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do so aware of the fact that, you know, in general, eating in that manner 
as well as intake. I always ate until I was full when I was young, but guess what? As I've gotten older, I can't eat all I want to eat anymore. You, be, you begin to have to, to uh, you know, understand that when God talks about gluttony, it's not somebody that just eats so much more than they should. They weigh hundreds of pounds more than they should. We tend to think that. But a glutton is someone that keeps feeding their flesh because their flesh demands it when they've gone past the point of need. And these, are, these are truths. And these things will kill you. It'll rob you of your good health. And it'll kill you. And in, in addition to the eating, you know, the Bible says, buffet your body, not buffet, buffet your body. That's an old joke, but it's the truth. Buffet your body, handle it roughly, and discipline it. And the analogy the Scripture uses is to an Olympic athlete or a professional athlete. They train hard to be in good enough physical condition uh, to run their race or whatever their um, competitive spirit might dictate. But for us, it's the same truth. It takes fitness and it takes eating to produce divine health. Now, of course, you know, that is to be a corresponding action to what you believe, that it's God's will that you be healthy and that you be healed of your sicknesses and diseases. Uh, and of course, faith is the way you incorporate the supernatural into your good health. But you can't sustain your faith in that area if you ignore all of the natural wisdom that's out there. Hello. He doesn't heal somebody of lung cancer so they can keep smoking. He doesn't heal your body so you can keep being gluttonous and eating whatever you want even though you know you shouldn't. And I have no desire to put anybody under condemna condemnation here, but I do have a mandate to preach the truth, and this is part of it. And this is one of the reasons he's sh shown me that a lot of people that are people of faith don't get the result they desire in one area or another. Money's the same thing. You know, God wants to meet all of your need according, he has met all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, for that to be manifest in this natural arena, there are other spiritual truths you have to be aware of. The entire kingdom of God works on the principle of sowing and reaping. And so, you know, if you want to experience wealth by the hand of God, you can experience it on your own. He says the blessing of the Lord is the only thing that makes you rich, adds no sorrow with it. There are a lot of people out there that don't know the Lord from Adam's house cat, and they, they still get rich, and they make money. But I can tell you I've known a lot of them in my day and to a degree to experience this myself. You know, there is no capacity in wealth to make you happy. None. The more you covet, the more you acquire, the more you acquire, the more you covet, unless you stop the progression. And it does nothing to bring you peace, joy, contentment, self-satisfaction. It does not. You know, wealth can't heal your body and it won't restore your marriage. It won't do most of the things that genuinely contribute to happiness or success in this life. So you can make money outside of God, but the Lord wants you to have all sufficiency. He wants it to be by His hand. And of course, we see one of the motivations that He's promoting is that it not be self-consumption. If your only motive in, in believing for financial all sufficiency and the only reason you make an effort uh, that corresponds with that faith is so you have more to consume on yourself, then it's not going to get it either. Faith works by love, a willingness to uh, work on other people's behalf. He says that when you want to have all sufficiency in all things, it is to do what? 
abound to every good work. And then, guess what? When that's your motive, he says that he'll give you richly all things for you to enjoy. But he's not going to do that so you can consume it upon your own lust. And so understand there are things that are the will of God for you, whether it's healing, all sufficiency in all things. It is for a purpose that is aligned with his word. And of course, the wisdom that we're told to ask for is both natural and spiritual. Phronesis means prudence. It is the word in Ephesians 1.8 where uh, uh, Christ abounds to us in all wisdom and prudence. The word wisdom there, Sophia, means both natural and spiritual. Prudence is actually defined as wisdom, the practical sort of wisdom that we need in this natural life. And we're told in uh, James 1.5, when if we lack wisdom, to ask him who give us, gives wisdom liberally, he says, but you need to ask in faith, nothing wavering. And he puts that in there because it seems to be easier to waver. When you have to make the call, you've asked for wisdom, and you think you may be hearing from the Lord, but you're not sure it isn't your carnal nature or your flesh wanting something for itself. So you can't be waffling around when you ask God for wisdom like anything else. You have to know that he will respond and he will give it to you. And the wisdom you're asking for is not just spiritual, it is natural as well. In terms of the ends that are desirable and in terms of the means to achieve those ends, it is spiritual and it is natural. And if you ever, um, you know, begin to move away from the understanding that there's always a corresponding action to the spiritual ends and the spiritual means of attaining those ends, there's always a corresponding action or works that need to complement the faith if it's not going to die if it's going to be sustainable and it's not going to be a healing that you get uh, one month and six months later, you lose it. And so that being the case, we know then that we are to ask, nothing wavering, we're to ask in faith, nothing wavering, and he will give it to us. So when we ask for healing it's in, uh, or provision, whatever it may be, and ask for the best means to achieve that end, both naturally and spiritually, then how's he going to answer? Is he going to just quicken it to your heart by the Holy Ghost? Well, I think there's several possibilities. But if we're going to be looking for it and not going to miss it, we do need to understand that it can be scary, a little bit scary to your flesh sometimes because it'll require faith. That's what faith is all about. If life wasn't a walk of faith, then we wouldn't have any need for that provision. But when he tells you, that these are the things you need to do to achieve a certain desired end. It might be a little scary in the natural, you know. Uh, but if you get over that, that timid part of you that wants to say, I don't know if that's God or not. If you're going to get over that, you need to know how he answers and be looking for it. And so I think that uh, for us today, realizing that these are the things that uh, the Lord will do in your life if you will trust him in the process and ask for wisdom when you need it. It doesn't have to be a great big deal. It can be any kind of thing. He's interested in every, aspects of, every aspect of your life. You know, take a look at the matter of healing. If you ask for healing and it's not come, what are you doing naturally 
to violate what wisdom would suggest you do. Same with money. Are you having trouble uh, getting your bills paid? Well, are you using natural wisdom, such as a budget? Because it is a fact, if you spend more than you make, it's not going to work out well for you. That is natural wisdom, not even great wisdom. It should be more in the arena of common knowledge. But uh, no, it is wisdom that you manage your money, that's the budget, in a way that you can ensure you don't spend more than you take in. I don't care how many credit cards you may have. I don't mean to be stepping on anybody's toes, but these are truths that you can reverse. If you've got a lot of credit card debt right now, the first thing you do is tell the Lord, you're not going to run, run up any more debt. You're going to trust him to meet your family's needs because you're tithing and a tither is guaranteed in the word that he will meet your needs and there'll be something left over beyond that. And so you're going to use your faith uh, to employ spiritual wisdom, but you're going to use your, the natural wisdom too that says you need to manage your money with an eye on uh, not spending more than you, than you make. As a matter of fact, spend less than you make so you got something to stick away. Hi, my name is Jessica, and I'm a part of the Accelerate Bible Training College team. God is stirring up a missions and church planting movement here at Living Word, and this is why ABTC is here, to equip and mobilize you to play your part. We have designed this college to offer accelerated training so that you can get prepared quickly to make a greater impact for the kingdom of God. We believe your time at ABTC will be course setting and life changing. Our goal is to make Accelerate accessible, and so we have a variety of ways that you can attend, including in-person or online. You can also attend full-time or part-time. Check out our website, college.lwcc.org, for more information. Classes start this fall, and we hope to see you there. Thank you for joining us for service today. If you haven't yet connected with our ministry outside of this broadcast, consider stopping by our website to sign up for our weekly Winner's Way email. Before we go, I want to remind the fathers watching that your love and investment in your family truly makes a difference. Have a great Father's Day. Join us again soon for our next broadcast. And until then, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.